start again. Uh, of the year. I'm really happy to have you here. Uh, and I just want to point out, um, first thing, the next one coming up is October 11th with Nico Franz um, in conversation with Kelly Dine. Uh, Nico is a systematic biologist. And he's going to be talking about the limits of synthesis for integrative biology. Um, before we get rolling and I introduce um, our hosts for today, uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of the spirit in that we're moving forward uh, with the conversation series. Um, part of the idea and, and what we think this really gives an opportunity for is to have a place that's interdisciplinary for people to come together and talk about big problems that we share across our different specializations. Um, so what we're looking for each of the conversation series to do this year is to raise a big problem, um, like for example, when we're talking about metaphors today in biology, um, and then think, and we can all talk about how to tackle those problems from the point of view of our dis different disciplines. So it sort of gives us a space to be interdisciplinary together and have something in common. Uh, without further ado then, um, I'd love, I'm happy to introduce uh, Mike, uh, Matt Chu. Uh, sorry, I'm talking too fast. Um, Matt was the first PhD student from bi the Biology and Society program here, um, and he now teaches in the program. And then um, he'll be talking with Sean Comer and Carolina Aboud. Um, who are current PhD students in the Biology and Society program. So the generations continue. All right, uh, Matt. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and give a quick intro. Um, is it going to be on this stream of metaphor slide? Or is this, should I go forward? If you want. OK. So this quote is about uh, living and dead metaphors. And here are some examples of uh, metaphors that we'll see in biology. Um, you'll see at the end of this quote, we have a reef of dead metaphors, which is itself a living metaphor. Um, but what I'm going to read to you today is uh, an excerpt which includes some rhetoric that we get from um, when people talk about invas invasion and in species in biology. Um, this is by Siddhartha Mukherjee, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning author of the book uh, Emperor of All Maladies, uh, published not too many years ago. And he's doing a comparison between uh, cancer, the field of oncology, and the field of invasion ecology. <clears throat> and so I'm just going to highlight some of the rhetoric here. Over the summer of 2011, the water in Lake Michigan turned crystal clear. Shafts of angled light lit the lake bed like searchlights from a UFO. Later, old sunken ships came into view from above. Pleasure was soon replaced by panic. Lakes are not supposed to look like swimming pools. When biologists investigated, they found that the turbid swirls of plankton that typically grow in the lake by the million had nearly vanished, consumed gradually. They could only guess by some ravenous organism. The likely culprits were mollusks, the zebra mussel and its cousin, the quagga mussel, the two species uh, are thought to have originated in the estuary basins of the Ukraine, notably that of the Dnieper River. In the late 1980s, cargo ships traveling from the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea had dumped their ballast water into the Great Lakes, contaminating them with foreign organisms. At first, the mollusks seemed like relatively innocuous guests. Then things took a turn. By the mid-90s, they were hanging from ship keels, turbines, and propellers in bulbous, tumor-like masses encrusting docks and piers, clogging water pipes and sanitation systems, and washing ashore, ashore in such numbers that on some beaches you could walk on a solid bar of shells. Eventually, the water clarity began to increase, the effect, effect at first picturesque and then eerie. By 2012, the Dreisna population in parts of the southern Lake Michigan had reached a density of 10,000 per square meter. By one estimate, they were 950 trillion mus mussels in the lake its bottom a crackling carpet of calcium. By 2015, the density was 15,000 per square meter, more mussels by weight than all the fish in the lakes. Billions of dollars in damage had accumulated, ships and boats had to be decontaminated, and water cleaning equipment dismantled and stripped. Dire warning signs that read, don't move a mussel, were placed throughout the lake, yet the invaders, the quaggas, ultimately, in the greatest numbers, continued to spread. What made the mussels such massive malig malignant invaders? Some of their aggression is a feature of their biology. The Dreisner are champion breeders, each churning out more than a million eggs a year. 
Yet in the basins and deltas of the Ukraine, these mussels seldom reach even a fifth of their peak density in the Great Lakes. They rarely invade depths below 30 meters, clump on boats, clog marine equipment, or form calcified masses. They are, in short, a relatively docile species, restricted perhaps by the quality of the water, by their natural predators and pathogens, and by the shallowness of the river basin, or by factors that ha we haven't yet identified. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Matt. <laughs> He's going to talk a little bit about invasion metaphors and biology. So here you go. All right, well, what you heard was a pretty typical kind of exposition of what invasive species are like and supposed to be like. So does it make sense, though? Does this metaphor of the invader really make sense? Let's talk a little bit about how metaphors work, just to kind of bring everybody up to speed if you haven't had an English class lately. Um, and uh, here's, a, here's a way to think about this one in particular, this particular metaphor. So here we have uh, Juan de Oñate, who was the first Spanish governor of what is now New Mexico. Um, I think for local purposes, he makes a really good kind of classic invader. You can imagine him as, as an invader. And then we also have a zebra mussel, a little bivalve, sticks itself to the rock or whatever and just stays there. And somehow we have to make this become that or that become this in order to get an invasive or an invader. So metaphors generally, we have a source domain and a target domain. Again, you're going to take something from this and apply it over there. What are the characteristics of our source domain? Well, it's a person. He comprehends certain things, right? Being somewhere, the fact that there are other places, taking, holding, defending territory. Uh, possessing things, generally. What else have we got? Well, it's a thinking creature. So it has intentions, plans, strategies. This is typical of an invader. And then we have the further complication of being able to carry out coordinated action with others because it's really hard for one person or one anything to invade. So somehow we have to shove all that over there onto our zebra muscle. And what do we get? If we succeed, we get this. Now, I didn't have to make that up. This was helpfully brought to you by the people at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in a Sea Grant poster done for kids in the Great Lakes region. So this is how your government is here to help explain bivalves to kids by turning them into an invader. But it, it is the Great Lakes, and what does New Mexico have to do with that? Well, it gets better because there's a new version, a very recent version of the invader. I didn't have to make this one up either. The only recognizable bit of that that's a bivalve is the head. Um, this one is a little more complicated because it also is obviously intending to hitchhike showing us that it has ideas about being here and there, and intentions, and all of that. <clears throat> so we've turned it into sort of a uh, semi-reptilian gecko, gecko without the tail and a, and a bivalve head. But who's done this? Well, the state of New Mexico.
What did we learn? What do we learn from this? What does anybody learn from representing a bivalve, which is pretty much sitting there, and we can't even imagine what it would be like to be a bivalve? <laughs> Um, does it really make sense to say that these things have invaded? Certainly they have arrived, although as far as we can know, all, you know, with no conception of what happened to them. They were doubtless pulled up with the water they were in into some kind of a boat redeposited somewhere else unknowingly with the water they were in. So they never left the water they were in. And then if they landed somewhere where they could survive, they did what mussels do. And we have decided to call that an invasion. There's lots of things we could say further about what you can do with this, but I just wanted to to, to use this example that Sean had f found that recent article on to say, here's a, here's a funny example of something. Is this a live metaphor? Is this a dead metaphor? Invasion biology would like you to think that it's a dead metaphor. Although they're going to use it, like they're going to benefit from it as though it's a live metaphor. Because you really cannot get invasion you can't get the, the, the general sense of invasion out of this. It's always invasion. It's always something with intention. It's always something coming to get you, to displace you, to kill you, whatever. And this is why I call things like this undead metaphors. They never really die the way a metaphor like cell or cancer, or organism, or atom, or element, kind of lose their references to, to the original ideas. We have new ideas that have been shoveled into them, and we understand them that way. They're not really metaphors anymore, thus they're dead metaphors. But invasion can never just become something for invasion biology that's separate from other kinds of invasion. So. This is the most succinct way I could come up with to put this. And these are arguable, and we can argue about them. That's fine. Dead metaphors aren't helping. Well, dead metaphors are fine. Undead metaphors aren't helping. Excuse me. I left out the un. And uh, there are a lot of people now who are, have been taking issue with this invasion idea. In, in ecology. Um, and there are other metaphors that in biology that have had these kind of problems, but we're, we're not going to you know, do an exhaustive list, and I'm not going to stand up here and lecture to you. So this is just to sort of set up where we're going, what we're talking about. And uh, so keep calm and kill zombies. Yeah, so today's discussion. Um, we're going to discuss and we'd also like to invite any audience participation. Um, we love talking to people with new ideas or things we haven't thought of. So we're going to focus today on metaphors in science. The invasion metaphor in ecology is our starting point because Dr. Chu has worked a lot with that. Um, but anything anyone wants to say about metaphors, living, dead, undead, what is a metaphor, why do we care about metaphors, all these sorts of things are fair game. Um, so if no one has anything they're dying to ask us, um, I'm going to start us off with a question for Dr. Chu, and feel free to jump in whenever you feel like. Um, the first question, I guess, is you've talked a lot today in, in written articles about the problems that the invasion metaphor in ecology has. Organs don't really invade. It's, it's harmful to think of it that way because it closes off us off to other ideas, but is there anything that we can find in the metaphor that is helpful or that you do agree with when we think about ecology? Um, ecology is built of metaphors. It's really, of all the, of all the biological sciences, I think the one that is, is constituted of metaphors. And, and 
there are ways in. There are ways to start talking about it. Again, when, when, we, when we are seeing something, understanding something for the first time, it's almost impossible to do it without a metaphor. You have to say, oh, it's like, you know, it reminds me of this. It's this kind of thing. Um, so they are useful. They're useful in any communication. They're useful in science communication. They're useful in, in having a conversation where you can then say, well, I, yeah, it really is a lot like that, or maybe it's more like this other thing. Or, and eventually, I think, hopefully, you move toward having something that is where you're talking about the thing itself rather than referring to it by comparison to something else. Um, so I, I think they're always a way in. The question is, is there a way out? Turn it off so I didn't like accidentally whack someone with the microphone. Um, so if we start out with these metaphors, with live metaphors, you know, someone comes up with a new way to describe something and it's really fresh and it makes people think, oh wow, that's a really cool idea. Um, I never thought of that way, or wow, I didn't know how to think about that, but this metaphor really helped me out. Um, after that point, we start incorporating it into our scientific papers, into the scientific literature, into the discussion. Um, how do we phase it out? When it, at what point does it become harmful as opposed to helpful? Like, does it? Do you find that metaphors eventually constrain scientific discussion to untenable lengths? Like, eventually or right now, with the invasion metaphor, it's no longer useful because we've exhausted all of the freshness or all the newness. Like, we understand the processes or we don't understand the processes and this metaphor is no longer helping us, you know, advance our scientific knowledge. Uh, that one's a more complicated problem in that... Um Metaphors. If we take, if we go back just to the invasion one for a minute, I don't think, honestly, I don't, because I know a lot of these guys. I, I don't think invasion biology really realized totally what sort of a tiger it had by the tail. We're going to be real metaphorical today. Um, when they sort of adopted that name, um, and it was not long before a bunch of people. It certainly wasn't just me. A bunch of people were starting to grumble about sort of how militaristic this was um, and how it really seemed to, to, as I suggested, impute characteristics to, to something that couldn't really display them and it wasn't, it wasn't helping in that way. But what the invasion thing is really good for is getting people's attention and getting the public excited about it and government agencies love invasion because it's a good way to get appropriations. You know, I mean, if it's an invasion, we have to stop it, we have to do something about it, we have to resist it, we have to, we have to react somehow. And thus, we can see if state and federal and, and other governments have have adopted this as the language of of the issue, um, but what it ends up doing is blaming the organisms for something that the organisms really didn't have in mind. If they could have anything in mind, I mean, even plants, fungi, microorganisms, um, and when you do that, that's good if you're trying to to be. Uh, kind of, kind of maintain a certain level of of power in the in the discussion, because the critters don't have a constituency. Um, so yeah, let's blame them. Unfortunately, focusing on them doesn't really s address the problem very much because it's people who are doing the things that are that are introducing them. So if we just focus on st you know stopping that, killing that. Uh, we have a very different view of the thing than we do otherwise. So this is why, in this instance, it, it's problematic. Um, generally speaking, I think we just you, you need to be aware of metaphors when they're in the discussion and decide on an ongoing basis whether they're helping or whether they're not. Um, and we can get in fights over them when somebody like invasion biology just will not let go of it because they've 
identified themselves with that term and 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 to say to say I don't think that's a good word anymore. We need to call ourselves something else. That would that would be a major loss of face <laughs> for that group. It would be a very difficult thing to do. Although individually, people have dropped out around the edges of that group and 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 are unwilling to kind of go that way anymore. Although it's hard to have a conversation with them without using their language. That's a challenge. Oh, great! Audience participation! Hooray! Right? Yeah. Uh, is the word here that? Metaphors are being used, that a particular metaphor is being used, or that a certain class of metaphors is being used, and if so, what class? It's not a worry that metaphors are being used because we, we have to use them. I mean, that's the language. Um, and again, they go through this sort of this sort of process of of becoming dead, <laughs> of dying. Um, and and at that point, they're just relating common concepts that we don't have to go back to the referent again. Um, but and I'm not sure that I, you know, when I when I say undead metaphors, I sort of postulated a class of of metaphors, and I think that these are the ones that have been uh, tried on and and found wanting somehow, uh, maybe not by everybody, but certainly by uh, a group who's we've we've we we as if we constitute a group we have we have made much stronger arguments against the idea of invasion than than the proponents of this idea have ever made for it because they we've thought about them more than they have um, so if there's a class if, if undead this this idea that I've come up with for this talk of if undead metaphors exist again they're the ones that are are powerful constitutive root metaphors the kind of thing that you cannot pull the old meaning out of pull the ref the the original meaning out of that sort of maintain a mix up um, we need we need to get past that but we can't because a variety of reasons we can't does that answer that question not sure. Okay. Let's let's proceed. All right. Okay. So I hear your distinction between the living, the dead, and the undead metaphor, and it seems like you want to have those categories as distinct. I don't know that I could tell how to tell the difference, and I wonder if sometimes it isn't all three. So. To point to my distinguished colleague Bert Holdover sitting right there. So, with so the idea of insect sociality, yeah. social insects. I mean, there's a very living and important and absolutely productive metaphor that also, in some ways, is dead because it's taken, for example, that we have the social sociality and perhaps is undead and that it may do some damage if it suggests anthropomorphization or whatever that word is. Anyway, so, so can it be all three? I mean, why do we want to make this distinction as if there were neat taxonomy of different kinds? And can it be kind of working on all those different levels and be effective? I think that, to use the example you gave us, the idea of social insects does have different connotations, even different denotations, depending on how close you are to the middle of that discussion, the technical discussion of what are social insects. Um, for Bert and his colleagues, they can talk about social insects. They probably don't even say that to each other that often anymore. It's just sort of understood what sort of phenomenon they're talking about. Um, as you get farther from that, when we go out to, to the, you know, for lack of a better term, the the, the totally non-specialist public, uh, they hear the term social insects, and that is going to create a whole bunch of potential ideas. Um, that they can discuss that may have nothing to do with what social insect people are talking about. Um, so yes, I think it's very contextual. Uh, again, in invasion biology, the invasion biologist face to face aren't thinking that much about invasion biology, about invasion as the term. They're not worried about that so much. 
but it, you get very far out of it. And the term is being used to, uh, to do work that they probably really didn't mean so much, although they're benefiting from the fact that that work is happening. Uh, <clears throat> you must be mind reading. <laughs> I had my hands off just before, but he picked you. <laughs> uh, let me give you an example in the sort of insect world, which is a bad metaphor, but or it's an undead uh, metaphor, but it's a bad one. Uh, this is the, the metaphor of the queen. Mm. The queen uh, in an insect society has no power whatsoever. She's just producing eggs <coughs> and offspring. And, uh, but among entomologists, the term is now used as a morphological feature. A queen is built in a particular way. Now, in the last 15 years, we discovered so-called workers, the worker caste, which is normally sterile, but in some sort of uh, less advanced social insects or the ants, some workers, they look identical to any other workers. They are mated, they have spermatheca, and they can lay eggs. And when the queen dies, they take over. Now, the discussion was in the literature about 20 years ago, or should we call them queens, but once they are reproductive. And the uh, Entomologists agreed we cannot do that because the queen has become purely morphological feature. Because during development, they develop certain structures which workers don't have. And though a new term was created, they are called gamma cats, egg laying workers. So, <clears throat> now, this queen metaphor, we, we don't get rid of it. It is there, uh, and uh, sometimes they are called giants, but it, it doesn't catch. And uh, I can live with that. But of course, among the lay persons, when you give a talk, they always, it, it's often a question you are asked, is she, has she the power? Is she, is she directing what these workers do? And this is, of course, uh, very misleading among us, of course, we know exactly what the queen is. On the other hand, I give you an example where I think a metaphor fits. First, where it was bad, where it was wrong, and this is the term slavery. Slavery about 100 years ago, when it was first described, uh, is basically parasitism. Uh, this is one particular ant species which exploits the labor force of another species. It steals the pupae and these pupae conduct the work in the in, in the wicked colony. Now the parasitism is when one species exploits another species. And this should be called social parasitism. However, uh, in nineteen seventy six I published a paper in science through slavery in eggs, where I first time discovered a phenomenon here in Arizona that ants conduct raids on, to, on other colonies of their own species and steal the pupae and bring the pupae over in their nest, in, 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 their, in the victor's nest, the pupae are closed and get adjusted to the colony odor and now conduct the work for an unrelated queen. So it is an exploitation of labor force of a different society of the same species. Now, I'm far away from claiming that there's an evolutionary uh, line from ant slavery to human slavery, but the analogy fits 100%. And this is with all the metaphors used. It, these are usually are, if the analogy is fitting, then I think it is permitted. Uh, this is also when we talk about territoriality in ants or invasion. Ant societies invade other colonies' territory and they fight for territory. Now, whether they have intention, I don't know. Probably not. But they all construct it so that they exploit possibilities where they can conduct an invasion. 
So so far, to your to your point. <clears throat> yeah. Those are, I think those are all great examples. And, and this idea of invasion being interspecific, where one group goes and takes over, takes, takes something from another group, um, that's a much stronger, you can make a much stronger case for that metaphor. We could make the same case for other uh, animals that are social in some sense, organized in some sense, and, and maintain territories, that if they're fighting over the, the extents of those territories and try, trying to get the resources in someone else's territory, it, then invasion makes a lot of sense for that. Um, the queen one is a, is a wonderful example of, of just a, an idea that was wrong originally, um, but it stuck. And so again, within entomology, you can talk about the queen without worrying about how imperial that queen is. Uh, it, again, you just, it's just morphological. Um, the other example, I think, would be, f you know, we, we probably don't have time to really get into it right now, but I think we could, we could talk a little bit about slavery and what kind of things are entailed in slavery, how because there have been different forms of slavery in, in different societies, at, human societies at different times, uh, which have been more or less oppressive to those enslaved. So there's kind of like, I think slavery is a complicated concept, and, and it would be would be uh, you know worth pursuing more to see exactly what what we meant in there. Um, but no, those were those were excellent examples. I think of of the kind of things that we're talking about. A lot of hands. Um, let's go in the triangle. So first, if I remember correctly, Gilbert, just from my observation, you got a lot of resistance to the use of the word slavery. Did you feel? I think it's because, because of the remember it was seventy six. This was when the help wrote out of the Ed Wilson published this book. The biology, and I was at Harvard at that time. And this great joy I gave the public university lecture then <coughs> in the science, and uh, I had on the title Slavery in Ants. And the doing and all these people who were not very happy, but they had very little to say in the discussion. Because, it's, of course, I am, you know, when you pointed out, I have been asked often in lectures. You know, do these ants know that they are now on APC? Are they suppressed? Of course, all of this is not the case. These ants function as as if they were members of these colonies, genetic and when they would even attack their genetic sisters if they are involved in a in a conflict. However, the the, the basic origin of human uh, slavery is not to, to uh, put pain on these people, mm -hmm. it is to exploit their labor. And the South, this is always the argument, the economy would have broken down if, if there would not all the richness and the, the, the wealth of, in the South and the United States was established on the base of slavery, the work, the workforce. And, and I think these colonies see it in evolutionary term, which can steal a couple of hundred workers. They do not need to invest to make these workers, because workers are only made to make, in order to make reproductions. So if they have already stolen so many workers, they can use these resources to make more reproductions. And colony fitness is, is measured on the number of reproductive produced. So it is really a base that an evolutionary economic factor to, to have slavery. And, and in fact, we believe now that this occurs much more frequently in the ant world. The problem is we cannot easily recognize it because they look all the same. Yeah. Right. And, and again, that's, that's a, it's, a, it's a great example, and it's a nice complicated one to explore. I think the thing I want to pull it back to right now is that when we consider having a source domain and a target domain, 
the source domain actually can can be uh, a little uncertain if there's something like slavery that has a long history and has been carried out different ways in different human cultures whatever the person who's hearing about this thinks of when they hear slave is what they're going to apply is how they're going to understand the metaphor so if what they understand is something about the way slavery slavery was practiced in the in the southern united states in the 18th and 19th centuries that would give them sort of one source domain to apply and if they were thinking about greek slavery in the classical period that would give them another kind of kind of thing to apply and if uh and you know you can just go to any other culture and work off of their local version of slavery so i think that's one of those places where where um if we all had the same idea of that source domain then we would all have the same understanding of the metaphor as it attached to the target domain but if we don't then complications arise in the second round. Okay. That's you then, bro. Okay. Um, so, kind of picking up on this and some larger trends that I feel like I'm hearing, is the question of using metaphors in biology, is it really two separate questions? The metaphors that we use within a field among experts and the metaphors we use to explain a field to non-experts? And those, are the use of those metaphors different or do we feel that what might be okay or would work fine in one domain for lack of a word wouldn't be okay in this other domain because as you brought up there are certain metaphors within a field that everyone just kind of understands and it's it's cool and they may still be problematic in that they constrain ways of thought or things like this but then you have the public and they don't see the metaphor the same way or they bring their own interpretations and is that a separate problem or the same problem i think as jane suggested uh, a, a, a single metaphor can be dead in one context and not in another so that within the specialist context we can we can kill these metaphors pretty quickly it's like any word that you just look at too many times or say too many times and suddenly it's just you know lost it um, but if we're communicating the to to non-specialists um, and if we're communicating through media who are specialists of another kind but they're gonna they're gonna have their own way of, of of hearing and interpreting and working with these metaphors, um, then it can become problematic. So I would say, to be normative here, um, it would be a good idea within any specialty to pay attention to the way we're talking to each other because of the potential for those things that we use as dead metaphors to get out and, and sort of color anybody else's perception of what we're doing in ways that we didn't really intend. Does everyone else there agree with that? Uh, so with relation to Bert's reference to the queen metaphor, I think that uh, this fits in with what Matt was talking about. Um, within non-specialist audiences, you're going to think of a concept of queen that involves some sort of imperialism and rule. Whereas uh, social insect researchers might think of it more as a, a sort of reproductive subtype. Um, and that's, those are different conceptions and those are different understandings. The metaphor seems to be the same one, just understood differently. That's, that's how I would uh, think about it. But to the question of whether it's more harmful to use metaphors to communicate to the public versus within a field, so maybe within a field, everyone's like, oh yeah, in the know about the metaphor. Like, yeah, we, we call it that, but we don't really mean that. We mean something else. I think those kinds of lingering linguistic kind of um, lazinesses are are harmful in a, in a long-term way, not only because other people not in the know may pick up on it and be like, hey, that's a weird way to say that. And it makes me think all these different things that, you know, the scientists aren't really meaning when they say it. But also within a field, it, I think personally that it, it makes us 
think about things in the same old way we've always thought about them when a key point of science is to think about things in a new way. So if we continue to accept these kinds of metaphors um, in our field without looking at them saying, hey, is this beyond the usefulness or, or not what we mean anymore? It's kind of preventing us from moving forward as a, as a scientific group. If you're not using a metaphor in a useful way, why are you using it? it would be my question. Let's go on it and then Jake. So um, earlier Matt said we use them because they're necessary. Um, and you can imagine like you're doing science, you found this novel thing, this is the first time anyone's seen it. You, you say, okay, well, how do I explain this? Well, it's like this thing. Do you think we need metaphors? Have you thought at all about ways to get around that? And uh, what would it look like? So I have a personal example for that. My um, research deals with the the words we use to describe fetuses and embryos because in a lot of different sectors of society there's a lot of different words used and it's not strictly a metaphor but it is the kind of language where you want to be specific about what you mean so when you refer to it generally embryos and fetuses as a collective of like what how developing humans occur in women's wombs how do you refer to the entire development process and the thing in the womb without saying thing or um, picking a specific term like embryo, fetus, zygote, blasphemy, or blastocyst. There's no single term other than baby or unborn child. And it's hard to, for me personally, to think of ways to talk about it without using perhaps slightly the wrong word at first. Um, and I don't know how that impacts where we go in science, whether we use a metaphor at first and then we change our minds and we make up a word or we use an existing combination of words um, and I think that's definitely tricky I'd be curious to know what other people thought about it is that on? I had on the original thing working back to your plan uh, maybe if we had studied it we would have found out that its own environment has its own enemies or biological itch or whatever, and we wouldn't have made that mistake, so that place is a metaphor on us. Yeah, definitely. I think we pick wrong metaphors, so the metaphors we pick don't quite fit, because we don't quite understand what we're talking about at first, and then it gets entrenched, and then we still kind of don't know what we're talking about. Jane. For an example of another one of my distinguished colleagues in this room, James Collins, he was the co-chair of a committee that wrote a report that talks about gene drives. And that idea of gene driving is something that a lot of people in the public have seen very positively. Oh good, we can drive. I mean, driving is good, right? So we can drive genes to do what we want them to. Isn't this nice? Even though Jim worries about that and says, wait, wait, but we're going to drive to bad things. So maybe a different idea rather than gene drives, like gene manipulation doesn't sound quite as positive. Um, yeah, there are other terms that might have been used. So a case in point that you mentioned, you know, choice of term means that we hear it a certain way, impute certain values to it, and then it's really hard to get it back. So Jim, who coined gene drive? And for the better part of a hundred years. Really? Actually. Okay. The notion of so called driving genes, they were initially described in the 1920s. Um, so at that, at that point, well, it's, it's interesting because at that point, driving would not have necessarily indicated something like driving a car and having control in that way. It could be more like driving cattle. It could be like driving a lot of different things, which would, which would be, again, our, our source domain is, is, is suddenly shifted into. In, into a confusing. There's a notion of driving an unexpected uh, ratio as far as Mendelian ratios are concerned. Okay. But continuing to use a certain phrase in the public has a certain, it, it causes a certain impression that maybe it's worth having thought about. Which, which, can get, which gets reinforced, I have to say, you know, what I can't point In this day and age, when you have. A, a set of technological arguments that are layered on top mm -hmm. uh, that uh, are really built towards the notion of control, the notion of controlling nature. So if you can drive in a very predictable way, you can 
drag on a lot of other baggage, then uh, then you leave, you wind up with a much more powerful metaphor of electricity in terms of being able to make whatever that part of the so, so again, there are, I, I kind of mentioned this a little bit, but I'll, I'll come back to it. There are, there is an idea out there that there are certain metaphors that can't be killed. Um, these are called either constitutive or root metaphors. These are ideas that are so sort of powerfully evocative in themselves that you can never really replace the meaning in them with something else. And it's been argued that invasion is one of these things that, in, that, that for to say a, a something as an invasive or an invading or an invader uh, species is something you just can never pull that old meaning out of invasion and turn it into some sort of relatively uh, neutral technical description that that can be understood another way. No matter what happens, you're gonna, you're going to you're going to react in a kind of emotional way to the idea of invasion. And um, drive, as this imperative thing, might have some of those characteristics. Um, there are probably, you know, that we, we could spend a long time trying to come up with a list of them and not really help, but this, the idea that, that not, all, not all metaphors are created equal. Some of them, some of them really uh, kind of get out of control once once they're established and it's only sort of belatedly that we understand oh yeah look what just happened with this this is something that didn't, nobody had in mind necessarily when they came up with it uh, but but it's it's still there and it's still doing things that way and you can't you can't change it yeah, so I, to take things in a slightly different direction I'm wondering about how we kill metaphors, um, undead or, or merely harmful, uh, because I'm worried that uh, merely cultivating individual awareness isn't enough, right? And, and what role do the scientists who use the metaphor uh, need to play, and what is the role of uh, people studying the history or the philosophy or the sociology of the metaphor? Uh, it's how are we going to get together and actually change these things if we think that invasion or the war on cancer or something else like the queen uh, metaphor are, are harmful there are to, to go back to the example that i'm most familiar with there are sort of signs out there that there may be a kind of paradigmatic shift with regard to using the term invasion and it's in its various forms um, for introduced species Within the science, it's becoming a little, you know, as as those of us who who like to hammer on these people for doing it continue to hammer, um, especially the younger folks are, are more aware of this, um, and they're they're finding kind of alternative ways to talk about it. It's not so much inside the science. I think this is, this is my impression of how it's going. It's going to become less of a problem inside the science, but it's going to be it's going to remain a problem in that uh, peripheral applications area of governments, um, NGOs who have realized how powerful this idea is, and the kinds of ways that they can use it for their purposes, which are not necessarily anybody else's purposes but for but for the purposes of of the bureaucracy um, and having worked in bureaucracies you know believe me there are purposes in bureaucracies that don't necessarily relate to any other purposes um, and if you can use these powerful ideas to to convince the folks that you need to convince whatever constituency that this is important and it needs to continue being done then you've set yourself up with a continuing um, set, you know, you, you've, you've got something to do as long as you need to do it you've got something you can grow um, so I guess the question about what's, what's the goal of metaphors metaphors I understand like they will kind of bracket how we talk about science or a concept and things like that and that limits the way you might look or encourage you to look at things in a certain kind of way. So is if you can't escape metaphors, is a good metaphor one that minimally 
brackets what you're doing or one that brackets it in the right kind of way, that encourages you to think about it in the right of that means or in this particular kind of way for a particular kind of end for some sort of problem solving or something like that, or is it that it is minimally intrusive on the way you approach that problem? For scientific purposes, I think it's one that, that helps you move on into increased understanding of what's the, whatever the phenomenon is that you're interested in. Um, and if it becomes limiting, if you've filled up that, the possibilities, you know, you've colored in all the possibilities of that metaphor and you still don't know everything, then that metaphor is probably not going to help you anymore. And, and then another one may appear to take its place. It's not something we, we tend to do consciously or purposely, right? I mean, this is just the way we think. This is the way human language works. Is it's, it, it's relational in this particular way. So, so if we get too caught up in one particular metaphor and in trying to elaborate it out to the nth degree, and, and then eventually you're, you're going to run out of ends in there. You're, gonna, you're not going to be able to go any farther with it. Um, and it's going to be somebody who, who looks at this a different way, uh, possibly creatively for the first time in a while, or possibly just because they're a different kind of thinker and they're going to have a different and they have a different kind of experience to draw on, and it's going to look different to them, and they'll start talking about it this different way. Then that might help, or it might not. You know, it's the kind of thing that has to be tested and and worked with to see can does this push us farther in the direction of greater understanding. Um, so when we get into it, it's funny when we get into actually self-consciously talking about metaphors. Uh, they become something a little different than they are in our just everyday thinking and our everyday usage. Um, and so you get, you know, we get very meta <laughs> in, talking, in talking about metaphors in a way that, that we normally don't really even use them uh, because they're just spontaneous, right? I just wanted to give one example, <coughs> uh, which answers partly your question. Uh, this is the phenomenon of the first discovered the dance language. Mm. Dance language, two metaphors. Um, papers by linguists were written about that, whether this is a language or not. Obviously, we agree now that this is not a language, but the metaphor dance seems to be fitting. This is this is in in the context of, of honeybees, right? Is that honeybees, that, yeah. Yes. yeah. And now we can talk about no one uses the word dance language anymore, at least in scientific literature, but dance communication. The dance remains because the figure looks really like a dance, yeah. and we human dance for different purposes. Uh, so it is, uh, they do it to communicate resources, either nest sites or new, new food sources. But they communicate astoundingly much, the distance and the um, direction, and all this is incorporated in this dance. But it is a, a form of communication and certainly not a language, as we define language with syntax and so on. So here it, is a, it was a self-cleaning process. <clears throat> and that might seem like a really subtle distinction to somebody who's not involved in thinking about communication and language and, and the technicalities of all that, but it is significant, right? Um, what do we do when a metaphor or a type of language wasn't, was done intentionally for a particular purpose and it wasn't, we use this metaphor in order to come up with a better way to describe this or in order to push a science forward, but it, we use this language specifically because we know it was going to cause this kind of action, and we as scientists <coughs> want to see that kind of action. And so the, it was very intentional, and it may still be harmful and very damaging, and people outside may be like, hey, we don't want to use that, but the scientists are like, no. You have an example in mind. I do have an example in mind. I'm just saying, you have an example in mind, so tell us what it is. So I study endocrine disruptors, and the term endocrine disruptor was picked very specifically, very intentionally, in order to elicit a kind of regulatory response that would cause these substances to be regulated. It wasn't an accidental term. It wasn't a term that we thought 
best communicated what these did. It was an intentional selection in order to cause a particular kind of response from a group of scientists. And other scientists looking in have, have repeatedly made the point that this term is damaging in a variety of ways and that maybe it shouldn't be used, but because the scientists who do the work use the term, it's, what do you do then? Then you write a paper and say, hey, this is damaging. <laughs> right? Draw, draw attention to it. I mean, the, we, we, don't have a, we, we don't have a kind of institutional review board for, for that kind of thing. It might be nice if we did, but all, all we can do at this point is, at least from my point of view, which is what I do, is I say, hey, what the hell are you talking about? You know, this, doesn't, this isn't really working out for us. Um, and uh, let's, let's, try and, let's try and move to something that is more descriptive rather than just evocative. Uh, I wonder if the problem with such metaphors as Mater uh, is not that they're live or dead or undead, that, but rather that uh, they trade oh. on um, the common incomplete understanding, or at least overt understanding of what they mean, which, which features of the, the source are to be taken over for the target. Um, on your list of things under the, the source, there wasn't any prescriptive talk. Um, there wasn't anything about uh, an invader is something to be repelled, attacked, resisted in any way. But that's precisely what they want to draw out right. of the use of it and what you want to resist. And in effect, the, the use of that word, as in many of the sorts of things that we've been objecting to, is that they have a prescriptive component that is somehow not spoken of. Uh, but used very much. And uh, the sort of analysis that Carolina was suggesting uh, might reveal that. I, I would hope that it would. And then the, that prescriptive use would be a lot less effective because you'd have to establish the connection between uh, a species having been there and now being here and it being something that ought to be resisted. Uh, so I'm wondering whether the problem is that in using metaphors, you always use some features of the, the, the source and not others. And by not being explicit, they're able to, to smuggle in something that's really there in the notion of invader. It's, I mean, you wouldn't call it an adventurer or a, an explorer or something like that, though they were there and now are here. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about something that's invading uh, and needs to be resisted. So you're Right, and, to, and I think, let me expand on that a little bit. I mean, invasion is not always a bad thing. When you are doing the invading for what you think is some sort of uh, justifiable, morally upright purpose. So when uh, the Allies invaded Europe in June of 1944, that was a good thing from their point of view. Um, they were going back, or it was the Americans supporting all these other people who had sort of been pushed out who were going back, but they explicitly were talking about invading Europe. I mean, this is as, as if that were the thing to do at the time. Um, and there's, a, there's some subtle differences between that and then, say, American forces invading Iraq. It, um, where supposedly our, our idea was not to go and take and hold and control territory on a permanent basis and take it for our own. Um, but so far, <laughs> you know, there's, there's been a, kind, of, kind of hints of, of that. Um, but it was, it was not advertised, it was not pushed to, to, the, to the American public as something that we really ought to regret doing. You know, we have to go in there and we have to do this thing. So yeah, it's the, the complications, there are, there are certainly complications. If something's coming at you, you think of it as an invader in one sense. If it's you going another direction, you think of it as, as, as an invasion possibly in another sense. Um, and so those complications do help muddy the conversation about 
how it's actually being used and what it's actually accomplishing. I think I could make the case easily that the most invasive plant species in North America are corn, wheat, cotton, soybean. They have displaced whole ecosystems. It's not like the so-called invasive plants that just come in and, and are interspersed with the stuff that's already there. You know, I mean, this wiped away the, of course, whose intention was that? Well, it was people's intention. But still, what's there on the ground is these, these plants. So there's, there's, is this some sort of al um, ally relationship between humans and plants? And, uh, but that invasion, if we, if, we, if we were to start describing that as an invasion, it would, it would quickly be considered a good thing by a lot of people and a bad thing by people who want to rewild the American Midwest. Uh, so yeah, there's no, there's no way to get any of these kind of concepts kind of cornered so that you can, you can say, yeah, it's this and not that. So I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, any last thing you want to leave people with before we release them from our prison of metaphors? Keep calm and kill zombies. Yes. Please be aware of your metaphors. It's Metaphor Awareness Day. Um, thank you for coming. We love talking to you and have a lovely rest of your day.